up, everybody? Hope you're all doing well. Thought, uh, <clears throat> I've been working on some stuff that I'm not ready to show yet, so I haven't been streaming anything lately, but this image is, doesn't give anything away, so I thought it'd be something to check in and, uh, maybe do a little bit of drawing here. I've also been drawing a little bit with this pen towel brush, and... It's been going pretty well, so I'm gonna try to ink this drawing with this brush pen and see how it goes. Uh, some weird shadows here, but we'll see. It's funny, I, uh, I have a lot of these like feather lines that are coming in this direction and they would be much easier if they were going in the other direction. And I didn't think about it until after I had penciled this. And I think if I was going to pencil it again, I would definitely flip the image over and do the mirror image because a bunch of these lines go in the direction that is not natural to the way that I ink. And this is actually, this was my rough. And then I light boxed to put the pencils on top. So, we'll see how it goes. Hey Richard, I uh, I order refills. Um, they just come in like packs of little boxes of like ten. And I've never had a lot of luck with brush pens. I've used a few different kinds before: some cheap disposable ones, some that are a little bit uh, higher quality and have refills and stuff. But I've never had a lot of luck with them. And uh, and lately I've been happier with this this one. So. I don't know if it's a good batch of like refill cartridges or what the deal is, but for some reason this ink has been working pretty well for me. Like the speed that I like to ink and the amount of ink I want flowing through the brush, it's just really worked really well this time. Oh man, yeah, glad you guys enjoy the Eric Larson interview. I am, <laughs> I'm ready to sit down and talk to the guy again. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun. I'm a big fan of him as a cartoonist, as a publisher. And getting ready to do that interview meant reading a bunch of Savage Dragon, which I have lapsed on. And going back and reading that stuff, I kind of love it again. <laughs> so I think he, he may have picked up a new regular reader. I think I'm back. And I ended up, messaging with him a little bit after the interview too about some other topics like um chris ware is somebody that i asked him about because he's referenced chris ware in dragon you know like he did an issue that was colored in sort of a jimmy corgan chris ware-esque style and uh i don't know i'm ready to talk to him again and just just keep going and and naming cartoonists and having him you know talk about what he sees in their work and what kind of stuff he's reading because I do think he reads a lot of comics, so it was uh, it was really fun to talk to him. If you guys haven't uh, given that interview a watch yet, 
be sure to do that because uh man he's certainly certainly done his share of cartooning over the years hopefully um you know if you follow him anywhere keep bugging him about that artist edition i'd really love to see that I don't know who would be tough to to get from from image i don't know i would be interested in talking to more of those guys though i mean they certainly a big part of my comics history never met Jim Lee I have no idea I mean he's pretty active I see him like posting drawing videos and doing a lot of interviews so I have no idea but the guy has to have something of a public profile in his current role Hey, thanks, Adam. Yeah, thanks to all you guys who have been subscribing to the newsletter. I think that's going to continue to evolve and hopefully get better and better. It's funny, since we started doing it, I keep subscribing to everybody's newsletters and uh, I don't know, any, any recommendations, anybody I should be paying attention to? What would you guys like to see in those newsletters? Anything, you know, it's still in a very formative stage. So if you have suggestions, um, we are definitely still open to trying some stuff. And one of my favorite parts about that Eric Larson interview is him talking about trying to keep things different not to repeat himself and I kind of feel the same way it's a lot more interesting if you're mixing things up and trying new stuff you know from a creative standpoint for sure so Hey, Massive Panda, thanks, man. Thank you. Um, the, the brush is a, it's a Pentel. I don't know if it will show up on there or not. That's kind of the little label. But it's a Pentel brush pen. I don't know if there is anything else to go with it besides that. I guess they maybe make a few different kinds, but... You know, this is what it looks like in pieces, and it's it's a relatively affordable pen. It's probably, man, this thing's probably 10 or 15 years old now, so I, I honestly don't remember what I paid for it, but probably, I don't know, $30 or $25, something like that.
Richard, yeah, man, on, uh, on, on tools. I spent 10 years looking for tools and asking everybody about tools and what they use. Um, I've kind of lost interest in the tool conversation in that um, well, the, the story I always tell is that I asked Dave Cooper about his lettering. Dave Cooper was doing a book called Weasel at the time, and it was just stunning. It was just gorgeous in every way imaginable, including the beautiful lettering that he was doing himself. And so I asked him what he was uh, what he was doing the lettering with, and he said a Hunt 102. And like I've used the Hunt 102s, and it was just magic what he was doing because like I I knew the Hunt 102 well enough to know I certainly couldn't do what he was doing. And I kind of backed off on the tool search at that point, um, realizing that it was unfortunately it wasn't the tool uh, that was keeping me from making the the beautiful drawings that Dave Cooper was making, but. I did spend forever, you know, searching for tools, and it's definitely worth looking for, you know, if you're not happy with what you're drawing with or whatever, and artists love to talk tools, so it's a conversation I'm happy to have, but I don't think there's any magic answers. I don't have any great loyalty to any of these tools in particular. I tend to draw with a lot of different stuff. And, you know, over time, you kind of figure out what certain things do, and then in my mind, like, I may pick a tool based on that, you know, like, I'm I'm inking this because I want large uh, black strokes uh, for, you know, like how I want this to look whenever it's finished. And so that's why I'm using the brush pen for this as opposed to, say, a pen or something with a finer line. Uh, Cliff, what do I think about the floppy format? Um... I'm somewhat format agnostic. You know, a lot of the, I buy tons of these like old back issue floppy comics, but it's not, it's certainly for the format, but it's it's very nostalgic, my attachment to those old comics that I'm buying. Sometimes it's paper and printing related, you know, reasons why I might prefer that over say a reprint or a trade. My issue is more of like, use whatever format you're using, you know? So if you're making a comic book, I want that comic book to be satisfying. Like if all you buy is that one issue of that comic book, I want you to get a good experience. With that in mind, I, I do wonder about the future of that format. I was thinking about it today. I think about it almost every day, but I was thinking about it today and it's like that, what, what you're calling a floppy, you know, a comic book, that format is almost a hundred years old, right? Like that shows up in the, in the 1930s. It's, totally different production. It's totally different distribution. None of that stuff is still around except we cling to the format. And I love the format. I'm, this is for a comic book. This is for what, you know, what you would call a floppy. So I love that format, but I don't know that it's a format that is, makes sense for majority of comics. So I don't know what the future of that format is. I hope it never totally goes away and I don't see why it would because you can make them you know, yourself with a photocopier or a printer and a stapler. So I don't think that format will ever totally be gone, but I don't know if it'll be the dominant format. Um, you know, it's really comic book stores are like the last place where that format really is sold, uh, you know, at least new issues. And I don't know that that's going to, there just aren't that many comic book stores. So it's, it's not totally viable as a commercial format, I don't think but that doesn't mean the format goes away. I think Art Spiegelman has a quote and it's about how when an art form, when a mass media becomes obsolete, it becomes an art form. I'm probably butchering it, so forgive me if that's the case. But if that is the quote, you know, the sentiment, whatever, there's no reason that the comic book can't, can't go that direction. You know, like I love the format, so when I have an idea that fits that kind of 24 or 32 pages or whatever, I am totally up for, you know, happy that I have access and knowledge of the format, but I don't know what it'll, what it'll look like in a couple years. And to be fair, I thought that the format was going away like 10 or 15 years ago. I remember when Tom, Tom Shuley was doing Godland and in my mind, I'm like, man, that's it. You know, that's like, that's going to be one of the last comic book series. And then there was a real resurgence at image, um, over, you know, since then, where they really started putting out some great comic books. So that could happen again, you know, it's, it's hard to predict.
At least it's hard to predict for me. I haven't been too, uh, <laughs> haven't been great at that. Yeah, I can't really tell you guys too much about this project yet. It's coming along. Um, getting closer to the point that I hope to uh, tell everyone about it. But that time is not tonight, <laughs> fortunately. Yeah. I feel like I've been spending more time walking now that everything is shut down, so whenever I, I need a break, I end up just walking around my neighborhood or going for a hike or something like that. And then, you know, listening to podcasts and stuff. And I was thinking, like, we're really going to get into, like, a weird time over, you know, as, this, as, as we all continue working from home and being isolated because of, like, boredom, you know. Um, you hear about, like, whenever we were kids or creativity comes out of boredom, but then kids aren't really bored anymore. Everything is scheduled for them. Activities are all scheduled. Plus you have a smartphone in your hand and, you know, there's just not a lot of boredom. And it feels like everybody being stuck at home now, there's going to be this uptick in boredom, which I think will translate into an uptick in creativity uh, or some effect from the boredom. So I was walking around thinking about that and realized like it's already, you know, like it's already super weird it just hasn't changed that much on an average day. Like my day hasn't changed that much, but for most people not going into work or whatever is a huge, you know, it's such a difference. I mean, I mentioned it on the weekly show, like whenever I quit my day job, it took me a long time to get used to, you know, working from home and, and not, not kind of seeing everybody every day. So hopefully you guys are all doing all right and, and adjusting and, holding on okay but uh yeah i do think there'll be some interesting artwork at the very least coming out of out of all of everybody working at home oh, man do i think phantom of the attic and copacetic will survive the quarantine yeah i mean i i obviously i hope so i i don't know i my least favorite podcast right now is anything that has to do with prognostication because like don't don't get any advice from me i'm ha maybe about inking or something you know I'm, i can tell you about what ink to use or something but um you know i don't know anything about what's going on on, on a larger scale so it's hard for me to say you know i don't know how long this is going to last i don't know anything so <laughs> i i don't know you know, I certainly wish them nothing but the best. And I think both of them are doing mail orders. And, you know, I'm not sure what else we can do exactly at this stage. But we'll see. You know, we might try to talk to some retailers and see exactly what's going on. Because I know there are things happening between, say, you know, Diamond and retailers. And, and every you know, everybody that's in this industry is certainly working. Um to survive and, and, you know, to move forward. So we may try to talk to some of these guys, uh, who knows, maybe, you know, it's probably going to have some long term ramifications. So these may be conversations we continue to have for quite a while, but, uh, me personally, man, I don't know anything. I love comic shops and I have a lot of friends who work in comic shops or even run comic shops. I don't know how they do it. Like on a good day, I don't know how they do it. It is uh, it is a lot of stuff to, to sort of juggle and work out and stay on top of. Not, not something I think I'm capable of.
James, you said uh, you're a retailer. What's happening? What's well, throw out your store first of all? What, what's your store name? Where are you at? And uh, are you guys are you doing mail order? Do you do a lot of online sales? Um, are you having curbside pickups? Like, what's what's happening on your end? What do you uh, anything you can tell us? What you're seeing? What's going on there? I've never been to the comic book shop in Delaware. I'm not sure I've ever even been to Delaware and I'm in Pittsburgh. Like it's not that far away. I'm I'm not sure why I haven't spent any time in Delaware, but hopefully when this blows over cuz I'm aware of a couple of stores in Delaware that have pretty good reputations. Oh man, rereading Scout's a good choice. I haven't read Scout since I was a teenager and I would like to do that. I don't know if any of you guys have, uh, if you ordered that wizard zine that Eli and a bunch of uh, fans of the show and friends of the show put together, but they have an interview with Tim Truman in it and he shows off some stuff from the new Scout uh, story or graphic novel that he's working on which is kind of cool and exciting, and I do need to do a reread of that series because it has been a long time. Somebody asked if I consider Johnny Homicidal Maniac an outlaw comic. Uh, I would say no. I like that comic. I don't know that it's outlaw exactly. You know, it might be a little bit outlaw in terms of subject matter and kind of <laughs> twisted sense of humor but I'm not sure that it's exactly outlaw in the sense of the way ink is used and I don't know what do you guys think a lot of this stuff is pretty subjective maybe outlaws in the eye of the beholder It's cool. Somebody actually sent us um, a Johnny the Homicidal Maniac book recently in one of our Mel, Mel um, episodes. And probably six months ago, a friend of mine was talking about Johnny Homicidal Maniac. So I gave him the comic books, you know, like I had it as single issues. And so I gave them to my friend and now I have the, uh, the trade collection. So I may do I may do a reread on that sometime soon. It's hard. A lot of what I read is for the show, especially now that we've started doing interviews and stuff. You know, I try to brush up on whoever we're talking to, and it's 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 very strange. I posted on Instagram some books I was looking at yesterday, and there it's for a cover that I'm working on is why I was looking at these books. But the books are movie posters from around the world, and then some design stuff like page layout stuff from the first half of the 20th century. So pretty fun, you know, like I enjoy looking at that stuff anyway, and it really blurs the line between recreational reading and research, which is fine, but it's it just kind of amused me thinking about the stuff that I read and what I'm looking at and why I'm looking at what I'm looking at. It's a little bit overwhelming, the amount of good comics, just the amount of comics that we have. When I started looking for reprints of like newspaper strips they would be really hard to find because i guess maybe they didn't sell in big numbers so they would do small print runs and then like volumes would go out of print and it would be very expensive once they went out of print to track them down so that is uh that's something that it's just very different now it seems like most of this stuff comes through and you know everything's been reprinted and is available in reprints
Let's see. Espionage comics with kind of 60s, 70s vibe. I am never good at answering this stuff on the spot. Obviously, Steranko comes to mind. Modesty Blaze is, is one to look up. And I'm sure there are like a zillion others. What do, what do the rest of you guys think? 60s, 70s espionage vibe comics. David Robertson, do I uh, do I ever copy the pencils before inking? Not really, but this is something I showed early on. Like this was my rough for this page, and then I light box the pencils, you know, on top. So, you know, if something went wrong, if I if I made a terrible mistake on on the inks, I could always go back and and recreate the whole page with that. But I usually sometimes I'll scan pencils, you know, if I think for some reason I want a record of them, but. It's not a regular practice for me. Oscar, yeah, the rough sketch, sometimes, yeah, definitely sometimes the rough sketch is better than the finished piece. The, the, you know, the way to try to overcome that is to, as you start to know what your ink is like, you know, your, your drawing, I mean, not like the viscosity of your ink, but how you draw, how you ink, how things look whenever they're inked, you can kind of anticipate and build the images that way. But you know, it's a very different image than the rough drawing, and sometimes that rough drawing is better. Um, if you've ever seen my aphrodisiac cover, that is blown up from a very tiny sketch of about two inches that started out as the rough sketch, and I did several drawings for the you know for the cover, and none of them were as good as the rough sketch. And in the end, I ended up scanning the rough sketch at like sixteen hundred percent in order to, uh, you know, get the image that I wanted. So, yeah, definitely sometimes the rough is better, you know, it just, that's the nature of making drawings. Like, it's, it's very much an opinion, but I have done a lot of rough sketches that I end up liking better than the finished piece. This, I'm going for something very specific. And so the ink version is definitely what I'm, what I'm after. And, and I have a pretty clear idea of what I'm going for with it. I don't listen to a lot of music. I don't know why that is. Usually, like if I weren't streaming this, I would be listening to a podcast. And I don't really know why. Sometimes whenever I'm writing, I will listen to classical music. But I don't, I, I tend to go, you know, podcast or maybe a book or something like that, rather than music whenever I'm drawing. It just tends to engage whatever, Whatever part of my brain is sort of like wandering or free during this process, I, I tend to enjoy, you know, the engaging it with a podcast. I used to listen to like talk radio and NPR and stuff before podcasts started whenever I would be at home drawing. Things like This American Life was, was something that I would, I went through like all of their archives and stuff. Ricky Gervais used to have a radio show 
before he did The Office. I listened to, uh, must have been hundreds of hours of that stuff. Yeah, Guy Pillard's work is great. Jodell, Pravda. <laughs> I've been looking at Pravda as well. <laughs> this is a... I love this guy's stuff. That edition that Fanographics put out of um, Jodell is one of the best books. It's absolutely stunning. And the extras that are in that book are so good. And I have like... I don't know what it is. Like maybe an original English edition or something. So I never wanted to break down and buy the new one. But my friend has the new one, and every time I see him or go to his house, that's the book that I pull off the shelf and look at. Cannon by Wally Wood is awesome. That is a fun comic. That's probably one of my favorite Wood comics just for reading. It's very enjoyable, and, and I think that fits that spy, 60s, uh, 70s kind of spy. You guys see me um, like kind of turning this and, and being a little bit slow here. The reason is I have wet ink on some different parts of this and the ink from these pens takes, takes a little while to dry. So it's very easy to smudge it. And uh, it's making me like try to think about where my hand is going and uh, whether that's a dry spot or not. 
like to work all over the page, but you do have to be conscious of where you've been. A smudge doesn't does not mean a redo, but it might mean that I'm aggravated or, you know, I mean, I'd rather not smudge. There's a lot of a lot of workarounds at this point, depending on how bad the smudge is. I could paint over it. I could fix it digitally, maybe. But part of the reason you work on paper is. You know, some of those qualities are just, they come with the wet ink territory, so I'm just try to stay conscious of where I'm at on a page. Yeah, do I own any of the John Jacobs, Ken Langriff, Madison comics? I have, um, what's their Frontier one? I guess there, there are four magazine-sized issues, I believe. So there are the two Dr. Peculiars, and I have those. And then there is, it's like New Heroes or Frontier Heroes or something. I could probably dig it out. But yeah, I, I have most of the Madison stuff. Uh, I might have all the Madison stuff because there aren't too many books and I have a friend who loves that stuff and so he's helped me find issues that I don't have or he ends up with doubles because he's constantly looking for any of, any of the Madison comics stuff. That's something I'd like to do a show on at some point. I, I like those comics quite a bit. I saw an issue of Dr. Peculiar was on eBay. Issue number two was on eBay like last week or something and the buy it now price was I think 150, which is just shocking to me. But I guess you don't see them very often. Makes me wonder, like, how many of those are actually out? You know, how many exist at this point? It's probably something that didn't sell, and so most of the print run, you know, was destroyed at some point, I would guess. But I wonder how many actually got out and how many are around today.
Yeah, Zinc Comics, Far Frontier. That's the that's the Madison title I was trying to remember. That's a good one. I think all those are good. I enjoy all of them. Wolf Angel is amazing. I think I have four of the five issues of Starfighter. I don't think I have the first one. It's like the big oversized tabloid one that maybe Neil Adams might do the cover or something or back cover. I know he's in that first one, I think. Um, so I like Starfighters okay. Yeah, I like Ken Langriff. So any, any Ken Langriff that I come across, I'm interested in. Um, you know, he's legit like a cartoonist. I like to look at his work. So whenever I find something from him, I, I try to pick it up. He's definitely a guy that I, I'd like to showcase at some point. Um, you know, Ed, Ed and I both have a million cartoonists that we like, so we still have quite a few favorites that we haven't, haven't shown off yet on the, on the channel, and uh, it's coming, you know. We just need, need time to get to everybody. But Langriff will get some shine at some point. Yeah, I, I'm a huge Charles Burns fan. I don't know who isn't a Charles Burns fan, but I definitely admire his inking. I don't know if probably a few of you have heard Ed and I mention, there was a comic book art show like in 2001, maybe 2002, something like that at a local university. And it was astounding. There must have been 150 different artists in this show. And it was all like alt indie cartoonist. And Charles Burns had pages in it. And it was the first time I ever saw his original art. And it was just like, you know, if you've ever seen his art. Honestly, if you've ever seen any of his work, the originals just look like bigger versions of the printed work. Like they're flawless. The lines are the sharpest lines you've ever seen amazing to look at and he was one of those like one of the early black and white artists who i started to, to find i would mail order issues from kitchen sink whenever they were doing black hole and so he was like one of those first black and white artists that i saw and was like oh yeah you can make like black and white doesn't mean the book isn't good or something you know you could do amazing stuff in black and white and he was one of those first handful of uh black and white comics that i looked at and was like that's it this is what i'm doing and I always think of him like if I'm doing brush inking, it's hard not to think of Charles Burns.
Yeah, Joe Sinod, of course. You know, there's a ton of classic inkers that, that I really like, and he's definitely one of those guys. Inking was such a different thing for that generation. Ed's got me looking at a bunch of uh, Klaus Jansen again, you know, from like the Frank Miller Daredevil stuff, but he's just done so much. And I didn't realize how much Jansen colored himself. Uh, you know, like coloring wasn't something I was, I thought much about the first 10 years or so of making comics. I was just making black and white comics. And now that I'm doing more color work and I, you know, you look at whatever you're working on and thinking about, so color has been on my mind a lot. And now I, when I look at Jansen, it's like a lot of the books that I look at of his, he's also doing the coloring, which is pretty amazing. There weren't too many artists, you know, like Marvel-type artists that would color their work. That was pretty rare stuff, especially as much of it as he colored. Once in a while, guys would color stuff, I think, as he tried out, but he colored a lot. We've been looking at those Frank Miller Daredevils, and I just, um, I picked up, is it Daredevil 191 is Miller's last issue, and I think Terry Austin inks it. And then 192 I just picked up, and it's Klaus Jansen doing pencils, inks, and colors, and it is like a tour de force. I don't know if he was auditioning for the job or wanted to show that, you know, it wasn't just Frank Miller or whatever, but man, is it a beautiful looking issue. And I had never seen it before, so it was like, you know, pretty, pretty new for me. Dude, S. Clay Hobacker's Nomad was one of my favorite comics as a kid, and he did like two and a half issues or something, right? Like very few. And he always does that, is it Protectors? Whatever the Malibu superhero book was, he does the cover of that one that's like advertised everywhere. And I always liked that guy, and he just didn't make that many comics. And there are guys that look like him a little bit, like a Jordan Raskin or something like that. I, I see some similarities to S. Clark Hobacker, but... Yeah, that, that Nomad stuff, man. Like two and a half issues or so. See, no way. Do I ever just sit before a blank page and not have any idea what to draw? Um, not really. And the reason is most, you know, like right now, I, I've been very busy for the last couple of years. So most of what I'm drawing is for something. So it hasn't been a big issue, you know, sitting in front of a blank page, not sure what to draw. And the last time that I was just doing drawings... Um, you know, like I, I was exhibiting those ballpoint pen drawings for a couple of years. And so I would draw, you know, I would just sit down with a blank piece of paper with those. But I would keep lists of things that I was interested in drawing. And then whenever I had the time to draw, whatever I was most interested in would get, you know, that's what I would draw. So I haven't had too much issues with blank pages being a problem um, for a while. I know the blank page thing is a thing, though. I, I definitely uh, heard of artists that have that. And sometimes it, it manifests in different ways. Like, I, I know people who have trouble because the page is so pristine. And so they'll just kind of scribble or put some marks on the page just to get past that, that initial 
I don't know, anxiety or something about, you know, going into a crisp new page, but I don't know. It hasn't, that hasn't been too much of an issue. I tend to do a lot of pre-drawing, you know, I'm, I usually do layouts for the pages that I'm going to be doing. And so even if the page is just a blank white page, I have an idea of what's going on there. Um, you know, it's not blank in my mind, but it's definitely something I know artists have have issues with from time to time. Doberman, Butch Burcham. That's that's uh that's funny. That's a guy a few of my friends have started collecting like with Comax and stuff. Um, you know, I tend to try to know what my friends are looking for, and then that way if I happen to come across them somewhere like at a quarter cell, I can always grab a couple of things for them. And uh a few a few people have asked me to look for Comax comics, which means then I become aware of them and I start looking and Doberman is a fun book. Hugo, I never know where artists are from, um, especially because a lot of, you know, like Argentinian artists, I think Eclipse, was Jorge Zafino from Argentina? You should rattle a few off, Hugo, if you have some Argentinian comics or, or comic artist favorites, list a couple, a couple of them, because, uh, you know, we may overlap a little bit and I don't realize it. Yeah, Al Columbia, Al Columbia is somebody I would like to do an episode on. He, he falls into that list of uh, all of my, all, all these artists that I like that I'm, I'm excited to at some point look at some of their work on the show and talk about what I like about them and, you know, show off some of my favorite stuff of theirs. And Al Columbia is definitely a guy who's made some comics that I really appreciate. Pim and Francie was a, was a huge comic for me. He was an interesting guy art wise because he was doing stuff where like he was using charcoal and all these like gray tones and textures that did not look like other comics. Like they, I don't know, they looked like, sometimes they look like old animation, you know, like old Fleischer Brothers kind of black and white type animation and stuff. Just very different looking. And so my friends and I would all, you know, we'd all be speculating on like, how, how do you make that mark? And trying to excuse it as being very digital. But of course it's not, you know, it's almost all on the page. And then whenever you would find, whenever you would see his art, it was like, oh yeah, you know, it's just, it's charcoal and it's different mixed media, but it was almost all done on the paper, you know, very little digitally. So yeah, Al Columbia's a guy. I've, I've looked at his art quite a bit. Yeah, I didn't realize Eduardo Rizzo was um, was Argentinian. I like all all three of those guys. Um, yeah, I think all those guys are outstanding. I have not read the Eternaut, and everybody I know that has read it, like I want to read it. All I hear is good stuff about it. It sounds amazing. I don't know if, if Ed has read any Glamour Puss or not. 
that's a that that was a very strange book. Um, so I don't know. Hope hopefully, you know, the main thing that I'm interested in is the Alex Raymond stuff, and so hopefully at some point that'll be collected in a more accessible way, because the glamour pu puss issues are not that easy to find. Yeah, I'm probably going to butcher this name, but Alberto Brescia, that Fanographics collection that they put out, um, his work is, yeah, it's gorgeous. I love looking at that stuff, too. Breccia. Breccia? This will be printed comic book size. This is, uh, I'm drawing it on 11 by 17, so, you know, basically the conventional size and reduction.
Um, oh yeah, the size. Yeah, this is gonna be standard American. This is going to be in a comic book. So size wise, Noah, Noe, um, that's the size. It's like standard Marvel image, that type of size. That Art Out of Time book by Dan Nadell is uh, one of my favorites. I've been going through that one recently, and that's a, that's a great, great book. At least in my house, that's a favorite. Uh, Jamwa, I actually, if I weren't streaming this, I would draw a little bit faster, but it's just kind of the, I don't know, speed varies, and the fact that it's Sunday night is kind of like bonus, so I'm just kind of drawing and fooling around, but somebody a long time ago, or, well, earlier tonight, was asking about the original sketches having more energy than the finished piece, and I think sometimes that's related to speed, you know, especially with rough sketches, like I, I do them very fast and they have a certain energy. And sometimes when you slow down and you're trying to do nice, clean, tight inks, I think the, the lack of speed can, can really affect that energy. Brandon, Dan Nadell was a comic book publisher for a long time. I don't know, 10 or 12 years probably. He published out of um, New York with a company called Picture Box. And he published like a lot of Fort Thunder guys. He published Frank Santoro. He did a big box set of Gary Panther stuff that's really something. And I think ended up remaindered. So you might be able to track that down you know, at a, at a fraction of the original cost. So he, he would do stuff. He was also the um, editor of the Comics Journal online for, gosh, several years. Um, he, he published a, a comics magazine newspaper thing called Comics Comics that then sort of became a blog or was a blog first and then 
the newspaper magazine. I can't remember the order of that. So he was around comics for a long time and works in more of the art world now. So doing curating shows and writing about various artists and stuff like that. And just an interesting guy who has a foot. He did, he did an anthology that was like critical writing about comics called the Gansfield that ran seven or eight volumes. Um, so just a guy that, you know, worked in comics, worked around comics from a critical historical and publishing standpoint. And I think produced some really great work. Like Fort Thunder was a, was a big influence on me. And he published some of the guys from that, like Matt Brinkman and Brian Chippendale. Um, he published Brian Chippendale's Ninja book. He published a few Brian Chippendale books. Uh, if and Oof, I think. Um, Puke Force. Man, Puke Force might have been drawn in quarterly. That might have come out after Picture Box Folded. But he published a lot of stuff and interesting stuff. You know, stuff that did not look like everything else. And I thought that was... I found, I found a lot of interesting artists that way. So when he did Art Out of Time, I think that was with Abrams, and he was sort of curator, editor. You know, anybody that doesn't know this book, it was artists that he thought had a certain visual uniqueness and quality that maybe weren't well known. And so he would publish an excerpt of their work, and then he would have like a biography, a short, very short biography, you know, a couple, few hundred words, depending on who the artist was, uh, in the back, which made it a nice resource and made it relatively easy to track down more information if there was an artist you liked, although some of the artists, they only did, you know, maybe one thing, um, you know, so, <laughs> or they only appeared in one newspaper or something like that. Some of them are very hard to track down further stuff, but it was definitely a book that exposed me to a bunch of artists that I liked, and guys like Ogden Whitney is in that book, Bob Powell, there, some of these artists are relatively well known in comics history. I don't know if that's where I f saw them first or how I found out about them first. Fletcher Hanks is in there, but you know, like Fletcher Hanks was also in Raw magazine. So a few of these, you know, like like a few of these artists who have gained a little bit more exposure in the last couple of decades, they appeared in a few places. And of course, Fanographics has done a couple of collections now of Fletcher Hanks' work. New York Book Review Comics, New York, yeah, New York Book Review Comics collected and published um, a collection of Ogden Whitney's wit, uh, romance comics that Dan Nadell, I think, curated, maybe Dan and Frank curated. I actually did some lettering for that book. But, um, you know, so a lot of these artists, like, that art out of time, I think, is from 2005, 2006, and since then, several of those artists have been reprinted in other editions and things, so. Yeah. Nadal recently edited an excellent collection of Whitney's romance comics. Ogden Whitney, you guys may know from uh, Herbie, the uh, Fat Fury, <laughs> an ACG comic that's pretty amazing. So Ogden Whitney had, had a, he had a career going back to the Golden Age, and I think he did... Airman or something. I forget the character's name. It's not Airboy, but it's something similar. And I picked up a comic recently that was an 80s book. And it was a reprint of that character. And it had like an essay in the back about Ogden Whitney and the publisher trying to track down Ogden Whitney, you know, to meet him. And uh, it details kind of the end of Ogden Whitney's life. And it was kind of a sad, sad ending to his life. But there's information out there about Ogden Whitney. You know, like he's a guy that's not unknown and had a pretty long career. And uh, Dan Nadell's written about him. Like he wrote an essay about the the quality, a certain quality of his art that is similar to Wally Woods in the way static characters or characters sometimes appear very static, almost frozen in, in certain moments. And kind of neat. It was in the first comics, comics, I believe. So... I'm a big Ogden Whitney fan. The, the romance comics, I think, are really strong comics and interesting and interesting for the time period, but also interesting just the way that guy draws and works. Skyman. Skyman is the one I'm referring to. And it was published, there was an 80s publisher, I'm blanking on their name, but they published a three-issue series called The Face that Ditko drew some of and like Alex Toth drew one of the covers that was really sharp. 
and they did an issue of Skyman, like reprinting some of the Golden Age Skyman comics by Ogden Whitney, and then there's a text piece in the back that's several pages long about the publisher's experience trying to meet Ogden Whitney, which is pretty pretty interesting story if you're an Ogden Whitney fan and you're curious about more about his life. It's a Pentel brush pen, and I'm actually done inking um, here, so I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon. Yeah, CF is another another guy. Power Masters, CF's probably best known book is another book that Picture Box published. So they were, you know, they were an art publisher that just had a very well. They had a slightly different a approach, which a lot of publishers have. You know, like they have like a style or something you would associate with them. And Picture Box is no different. You know, they had a very distinct style because it was a small operation. I, I think it was mainly Dan Nadell and and his taste and the artists that he liked. Ben Jones was somebody that he worked with a lot who I think is at Cartoon Network now or was at Cartoon Network for a while, you know, got into animation, but is also a very good cartoonist. All right, guys, I think that's going to do it for me tonight. Um, thank you for tuning in and uh, keeping me company while I do this. Appreciate that. It's, uh, it's good to get a little bit of interaction with people. So I appreciate you guys all hanging out and um, stay safe. You know, as we always say, um, subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon. So whenever we do live stream like this, you'll get a notification. Um, we've been doing that with our weekly shows and with some mail episodes and whenever whenever uh, we're drawing certain things that we can share. So hope to see you all again here uh, soon. And until then, stay safe and read more comics.